Good evening, everybody. I think we should start. Um, I'm uh, Ian McLean. I'm one of the politics fellows at Oxford Nuffield. Um, I'm a specialist in, among other things, subnational politics. So uh, I'm very glad to welcome for this one-off uh, seminar uh, Paul Plamondon, who is, as you've all seen in the circulated uh, information, the leader of the Parti Québécois. Uh, I know just from looking around the room that there are some people here who know a great deal about Quebec, Canada and Quebec politics, and there will be others who know nothing. So uh, I'll simply... Uh, say and leave most of the story to uh, Paul that uh, uh, there have been two referendums in recent Canadian history on uh, Quebec independence, given a different name in also in different languages, uh, and at the second of those in 1995 uh, the yes to independence uh, came considerably closer than uh, it was a considerably closer result than in the Brexit referendum in uh, in the UK, and make of that what you will. <laughs> so uh, the Parti Québécois has been in government in Quebec. It is not currently in government. In fact, the first past the post, as we call it, electoral system has been pretty cruel to it in recent elections. But uh, the um, uh, I, I will tell you what maybe we'll have already learned that Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon is a lawyer by training, he's a member of the, has been a member of the National Assembly in Quebec since the last election. Uh, he has studied at Lund University, McGill University, and this one. And he's worked as a human rights lawyer in Bolivia, in Belgium, uh, before <coughs> starting practicing law in Quebec. He became the leader of the party before he became a, 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 a member of the parliament. And uh, the last detail he's given us, which I know he's going to talk about, and which may be the detail that has brought some of you along here, is that you became the first MP in Canada's history to take office without having sworn allegiance to the king. So we run this on the normal uh, lines that uh, 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 Paul will speak for 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, um, normal convention is that Questions of clarification are okay during the talk, but hold substantive questions, comments, criticisms, denunciations until after. <laughs> uh, uh, so, without more ado, I have pleasure in uh, letting, you, letting you start. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for welcoming me. Uh, it's uh, an honor to be here after. No problem. Um, it's a, really a privilege to be here after uh, 18 years since I've graduated uh, at Said Business School, uh, very near. And um, 18 years I haven't been back. And if I would have been told at that time that I would come back as the leader of the Parti Québécois, uh, talking about the oath to the King of England, I would have never believed it. Uh, normally when you take uh, education like an MBA, you're after a business uh, career and what I did uh, I was a shareholder of a law firm and while I was managing a law firm I started uh, doing some uh, television and radio as a political analyst just for fun and I enjoyed it a lot and the more I spent time the more the question of independence of Quebec became uh, compelling to me whereas I was not really involved in the movement uh, before I became a member for the first time in 2016 while running for the leadership at the same time, which is kind of original. Um, and so 18 years later, I'm here to talk about a project and a vision uh, for Quebec that is compelling enough for me that I decided to spend my, uh, my, whole, my, my all, uh, whole my time uh, on that uh, project, on that topic. Um, I'm used to do that in French, so if there's a word or, or two that uh, needs a more specific translation, you're welcome to, to help. Um, and I want to start off with the concept of sovereignty. Uh, you're studying uh, those topics, but I will give you in a very plain and simple uh, way what we believe at the Parti Québécois is the essential uh, the uh, core of that project. So sovereignty is about who's the authority, who's deciding. And so I think it's about democracy. 
Uh, how do you define democracy? And how do you combine democracy with history when this history is of colonial nature? And um, if we look at the, for those of you who are not very familiar with the evolution of uh, Quebec, Canada, and North America in terms of uh, co colonialism and uh, the status of Quebec within the, the British Empire, here's a few dates that need to be mentioned to understand the evolution of that society. Uh, it's important to mention that as of today, Francophones in Quebec amount for 2% of the population in North America. So I'm starting with this instead of a historical uh, fact because it has always been an improbable uh, guess, uh, an improbable bet that a society in North America, with 98% of people speaking English as a common language, that this 2% may last, may have a sustainability from a cultural and linguistic standpoint. And it's even more surprising when you look at the sequence, the historic sequence that led to that uh, situation. So basically you have, uh, sorry for that, basically you have the uh, conquest uh, in uh, 1759 and 1760, the cities of Quebec and Montreal will fall to uh, the British Empire. And uh, starting with 1763, a new regime, a British regime, will be put in place in Quebec with Francophones that are Catholic and a British rule that is Anglican. And uh, this will lead to many reforms, and I don't want to go through each reforms, but it has been constant that for Francophones across Canada, of course you find the most, the majority of the Francophone population in Canada and Quebec, but in each provinces, there has been a struggle for equality. And um, in the case of Ontario, it is the, for instance, the topic of schools that would force Francophones to go in English schools. In the case of eastern provinces, Acadia, it was the deportation of Francophones uh, to, to the U.S. El elsewhere. In the case of Quebec, uh, the most famous moment is the revolt from the patria of the Patriots, um, where the uh, population asked for not independence, but a fair democracy, a fair representation. And that led to a repression of that rebellion uh, by uh, the British Empire. And after that rebellion, it also led to um, <clears throat> experts that were sent by London saying, well, maybe the simplest, the easiest way to deal with that population is to ensure that in a few generations, they'll speak English so that we don't have to deal with those issues anymore. It's called the Durham uh, Report. And so, in many occasions, the democracy in Quebec is faced with other interests that historically were the interest of the British Empire, and that today in Ottawa is the interest of many other provinces in a very, very vast territory that is the territory of uh, Canada. But I'm, I'm getting to the core of it in terms of democracy. What is difficult in terms of letting people decide for themselves and making sure that they decide based on the interest they think they have is when you have for historical reasons and geographical reasons many other interests competing in another parliament on top of your own parliament that is Ottawa, the uh, federal government. So uh, without going into each step that led to the separatist or independentist movement uh, of the Parti Québécois through uh, wars uh, and issues around conscription, through uh, issues of representation in Ottawa in terms of uh, language, economic interests, there's been a, a constant and growing movement so that Quebec becomes a country that decides for itself. And it's interesting to have that conversation today because it is fairly Maybe not in the uh, academia, academia, but in the public space, it is fairly recent 
that we hear about decolonization. Uh, and, and we are really dealing with colonial, colonialism and a constitution that is really embedded in, color, in, uh, in the British colony, uh, a, a constitution in Canada that was uh, originally written in 1867. The movement of my party starts more or less with what we call the Quiet Revolution in the 60s in Quebec, because at some point, Quebecers, Francophones in Quebec, decide that they want more power and that they have the education and the economic leverage to uh, exercise that power. It comes with uh, many factors that are very uh, specific to uh, Quebec. Uh, we had, I think we can say we have or we had a complicated relationship with the Catholic Church. And so institutions were ran, run by the Catholic Church. And um, the 1960s is the moment where Quebecers also choose to separate the church from the state. And it, it sounds like a theoretical uh, point, but really like from my grandmother's standpoint, it is the most important point uh, of her uh, lifetime uh, because um, it, it was a regime, the, if I may just have a parenthesis on that topic, the Catholic Church was a regime really embedded in each institution of the state before the 60s, but was also collaborating with the British uh, rule. And it's very important to see that bizarre uh, setup uh, of a, an institution that had a lot of moral power over the generation of my uh, grandparents and uh, had a, a, some, a, a double role, a role of uh, dealing with uh, the central power of uh, the British uh, Empire and at the same time a role of uh, delivering education, health and so on. So when in the 60s there's a movement to ri get rid of uh, religion in the state, it, it triggers a movement, a movement that leads to the foundation of the Parti Québécois in 1968. And the idea is very simple. We should be deciding for ourselves because we don't need a government on top of our government, given all the difficulties that we have on several topics. It comes also with a, with a very strong linguistic and cultural um, movement. Uh, of uh, trying to make the French language not the language of a minority, uh, not the language that is uh, perceived as a disability. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want to exaggerate uh, by using the word disability, but as a disadvantage. A movement that uh, thought that from now on, on the, on the Quebec territory at least, French would be as in any country that has a national language and that the culture would follow. So uh, all this happens in the 60s. And the party is founded by René Lévesque, who's a very famous uh, journalist, uh, very famous for his um, TV programs uh, that start, uh, talked about all sorts of uh, political topics. So he's very known by the, from the population, but yet nobody takes that party very seriously at the beginning. They're not close to taking power. And even a few months before their first government in 1976, nobody thinks really that the Parti Québécois will uh, get the power as uh, they did uh, for two mandates afterwards. And this will lead to a first referendum. So the convention or the consensus, it's been debated within the Parti Québécois, but quickly there's a consensus that if Quebec is to become a country, it should be through a uh, democratic exercise, that is uh, the referendum. And that first referendum will be lost uh, at around 40% yes, 60% uh, no. And uh, this will lead to promises and to initiatives, such as uh, the uh, Meech Lake uh, attempt to bring all provinces together. So in the 80s, there's been a, a reaction from Canada saying, well, we have an issue here. How about we sign a new deal? How about we find solutions so that everybody's comfortable? and that we don't go through that exercise again. Unfortunately, all those attempts, um, Meech and then another agreement called Charlottetown, will fail. And will fail with a lot of uh, symbolic moments where obviously um, Quebec is not the most popular place in Canada. So the strong images that I think stayed in the minds uh, of uh, Quebecers afterwards. And uh, under Jacques Parizeau, 
leader of the Parti Québécois, um, a second referendum will be organized in 1995 and uh, with a result that is 50-50, uh, a few decimals uh, difference from one side to another. And on top of that, allegations of people who shouldn't have uh, the, vote, the right to vote, who were not residents, who actually voted, and uh, on both sides, allegations of how the funding was organized or not. And so the result was very tight. And um, since then, the, um, there was no serious attempt to organize, again, a new referendum. I have to say one uh, last historical moment that I uh, didn't mention, but is, is essential to understand. Between the first referendum and the second referendum in 1982, the Constitution of Canada was, uh, was uh, bona fide, was uh, changed. And, uh, sorry? Amended. Amended is the right word, thank you. Um, the Constitution of Canada was amended, and René Lévesque, who had just lost the first referendum, represented Quebec in an attempt to have uh, Quebec part of that new constitution, that new attempt. And that constitution was signed without Quebec, uh, with René Lévesque being absent, and with the uh, signature of the Queen of England at the end, but without Quebec. So it raises also, from a political standpoint, issues of legitimacy. It raises also legal issues, uh, because there's a legal... Uh, uh, legal uh, procedure right now on that topic as uh, on uh, many other topics. So it's a very, very quick uh, summary, but here's a few, here, here are a few dates, moments that uh, need to be mentioned when we get to the core of it. Uh, that is, what is the status of that idea and that project today? And why a guy like me and other people uh, that are together with me in that party, uh, we spend time and energy on that project uh, that is independence of Quebec. So as I mentioned, as of uh, today, not only there's only 2% of Francophones in North America, but the data we have as to the proportion of Francophones in Quebec is that the uh, French language is in a decline. Um, there's debate, there are many ways to measure that decline, but whether you take the language at home, the language that you use daily, the language that you use at work, the language of cultural consumption, uh, of uh, cultural uh, uh, habits, um, all the data uh, points towards the same trend. Um, and one topic that is important right now is the attempt of Quebec to strengthen laws that is supposed to help the French language, but there's debate about the effectiveness of that law. And at the same time, a debate on official languages at the federal level, where currently Ottawa doesn't uh, collaborate or doesn't consent to the demands of Quebec in terms of protection of the French language. Um, you have the same topic on culture, so of course, Given the fragile status of the Quebec culture, one issue is how do you deal with giants such as Netflix, YouTube, and, and the globalization of culture? Uh, even uh, the CBC, uh, uh, the head of the CBC, uh, Catherine Tate, her name is, said that uh, we were before a unprecedented form of cultural imperialism. And that's the word she used, and she's from... Uh, She's not from Quebec, she's uh, the, the head of the whole uh, CBC. So how do you deal, if you have a small population in a language that is not English, how do you deal with the standardization of culture? And yet again, Quebec has demands so that there's a specific... Encadrement, um, uh, um, a specific... Um, framework, legal framework, protecting the specificity, the diversity that we represent in terms of culture. And there again, uh, it was my intervention a few days ago in, uh, in the National Assembly, and nothing has worked. Uh, and uh, there's no hope, in the short term at least, that the uh, CRTC, the board in charge of uh, regulating those topics, will make something specific for Quebec. And it is an issue because the cultural environment has changed uh, very importantly. 
Another topic that is uh, very uh, relevant right now is the vision of secularism. And it's been the case for now 15 years in Quebec, a debate that is taking a lot of space. We were talking about it uh, before, and I want to point out what is the definition of a secular state under the current Bill 21, it is uh, the name. So the this idea of secularism is really that if you represent the state in a uh, in a position of authority, you should uh, refrain yourself from showing a religious bias or a religious sign. Uh, we've seen uh, several countries in uh, Europe having that debate and giving responses that are different, but as a whole, it really uh, only uh, applies to people in position of authority in uh, connection with the state. So that the perception, and we have to get back to what I just mentioned about the 60s and the quiet revolution, the idea being that if the state does something, it should not be mixed in any kind of way with religion. And uh, it's it transformed itself because it's quite technical or conceptual conversation. What is a secular, uh, secular state? Many re uh, responses would be possible, but um, it transformed itself into identity politics. I think it's fair to say that over the past 10 years, those topics had, have become a source of uh, identity politics, not only in Quebec, but in Canada as well, because the response from Canada is, uh, I think, from my point of view at least, identity-based politics, but the identity is uh, uh, communi uh, community identities. Uh, those communities can be of uh, ethno-cultural backgrounds, of religious backgrounds, or of um, any form of identity that uh, can create a, a, a group, uh, a component of society. But those identities have been put forward very strongly by the Trudeau government uh, as a source of a, a common identity that would be post-national. And he says that Canada would be a post-national state. And from Quebec point of view, um, a bill like uh, uh, the secular bill is about universality of laws and citizenship. So it's about identities that are shared and common above our differences, whereas you have Canada, I think, taking a, a whole different stance on those issues and really being about what group are you ide identifying yourself to. Um, it's not that there's no nationalism in Canada, like uh, the main uh, stores like Canadian Tire and Tim Hortons will bring you your, your Canadian flag every time they get a chance, but the doctrine is still a more community-based identity, whereas uh, there's something Republican or universal about Quebec's conception of identity. Um, and I think this is also an important topic that really creates all sorts of political movement between Ottawa and Quebec on a very regular basis. Then uh, another topic that is relevant right now is the environment. So Quebec um, has no interest in petroleum uh, at all. We don't have it. And uh, we have a very strong potential for green energies and a very strong opinion for uh, a shift uh, so that we don't have petroleum anymore. Whereas whether it's a liberal or conservative government, Alberta's oil has a very strong lobby and a very strong presence in the conception of Canadian economy. So in principle, the liberals should be more uh, interested in the environment, but they didn't uh, they were not afraid in investing in uh, new pipelines or uh, to take measures that are, in my view, pretty inco incoherent with what they say in terms of environment. And if the Trudeau government falls and is replaced by a Podiev government, if you don't know uh, the conservative leader, you can go on his Twitter account and you'll find tons of video about how uh, positive uh, Alberta's uh, oil is. And it's really incompatible from a political standpoint. I'm not taking a judgment on whether economically or, but from a political view uh, in Quebec, it's incompatible. And I'm not sure uh, it's really a, a good for our economy neither. So that's another topic that becomes really relevant. Um, 
First Nations is also uh, relevant because from Quebec's standpoint, there's a lot of um, ceremonies about First Nations in Ottawa. But as far as we are concerned, colonialism is still there under the Indian Act. And the Indian Act is something... I just want to make sure I choose my words, but uh, I'm looking for a strong word. It's, it's the piece of legislation that's maybe the most unacceptable above all pieces of legislation in Canada and Quebec. And it's never been reformed, but we have all sorts of new theories and new symbols and new ways to signal uh, how important that issue is, from my standpoint at least, yet the legal framework of the Indian Act is not close to move. And so from a sovereignist uh, point of view, if you separate Quebec from Canada, you trigger a change in the legal framework, and that's a beautiful occasion to start a nation-to-nation -nation negotiation with the help of the United Nations. So it, from Quebec's standpoint, at least from, for a, a part of the population, from, from uh, the standpoint of independentists, something needs to change in substance, not in moral signaling, and the independence of Quebec might trigger that occasion to have durable and respectful relations uh, between uh, nations on the territory of Quebec. And then you have very uh, recent uh, topics with the borders. So uh, for some reason, there's one place in Canada when you can, where you can cross uh, uh, without uh, going through the normal uh, procedure at the uh, border, and it's called Roxham Road. So 99% of the irregular entries in Canada are in Quebec. And for some reason, the Trudeau government thought it was a good idea to give contracts to uh, related uh, companies, to the uh, companies related to their party, to institutionalize, to make that permanent, and it creates a topic about why does Quebec not control its border, and why are we not determining from a democratic standpoint how we should deal with this? Why is it imposed to us? So, it is about the borders, but I think it's more about democracy and our capacity to plan in proportion of issues such as uh, uh, housing. Uh, language uh, services. Um, and then last, uh, it's a lot of uh, topics, but I just want to go through what's relevant right now on that topic uh, from my standpoint. Uh, the last one is that in 2018, the Quebecers elected a, a CAQ government. It's a coalition government. And that government is officially federalist. Federalist, but it says also that it welcomes both independentists and Federalists at the same place, and they promised substantial improvements thanks to their autonomous approach within Canada. And they said that over and over and over, and it, it was very popular because it's basically you can solve issues without going through what the Parti Québécois puts forward, that is a, a referendum and a democratic process. And the years are passing, and now we're almost five years after their election, and the it, it, I think that they're around 0 for 21 on substantial demands. It's, it's, it's getting heavier. Every time they pretend they will get something and they don't get it, the demonstration becomes... Uh, uh, in French, we say demonstration par l'absurde. Uh, absurdity can help show that something doesn't work. And it, it, it's becoming, uh, at least for my work in the National Assembly, the way the Premier responds to me by not answering the topic I'm putting forward because there's nothing to answer, no, nothing, uh, not, not a single answer that would be satisfying given that it's uh, uh, difficult failures such as in the uh, healthcare uh, topics that I just mentioned. So there is a, a feeling, as far as I'm concerned, I think there is a feeling that the demonstration has been made by people who tried to work within the federal system and that those topics are important enough to the Quebec population that we should at least take a step back and think about what are the options if fundamental issues like those, these ones are not working to our satisfaction. So I think that's the current environment uh, that we're uh, working in. And then came this very unusual, uh, it is funny and it is not funny at the same time, this Oath to the King of England uh, event. Um, quickly, what happened is 
we have a few debates on television and during the second debate at uh, the French CBC, at the very end of the debate, everyone is asked, what do you think about the oath to the King of England? And it's a very unusual question to ask. Nobody, I'm sure, among all those leaders were, was prepared with a specific answer because it was not among the topics we should be dealing with during that campaign. It just came. And my position was known before. I, I didn't want to uh, uh, give an oath to the King of England simply in terms of coherence and democracy. I, I didn't understand how my first act, my first initiative as an elected member of parliament would be to give my loyalty to a foreign power that on top of that created uh, harm because of British colonialism. I, I just didn't understand how that could be my first commitment. So I spontaneously said, there's no way I'm going to I'm going to give an oath to the King of England. And it was a very short answer. No way I'm doing it. I got elected. And then the first question in the few days after the election, the first question is, so what are you going to do with the oath uh, to the King? And I said, I'm not going to do it. And, and afterwards, there was a lot of analysis that uh, I had a strategy. I just committed to something. And I thought it was not only... Uh, disgrace in terms of uh, loyalty to the people of Quebec, but I didn't want to lie. I, I, I just had uh, I, just, I had just taken a commitment on television before all Quebecers. So uh, my colleagues uh, agreed, and we just decided to stick with our uh, position. And through a very long process, whereby we were told that it was not useful, that we should go to work that people didn't care about that uh, issue, uh, that we would fail. And that was said on several occasions, you will fail because it's illegal. Somehow we managed to have a law that passed and that allowed us to uh, get in the uh, Salon Bleu, the National Assembly, without taking that oath, which creates a precedent and I think creates a stability for the uh, future. I think uh, we will never see in Quebec again uh, someone taking an oath to the King of England. And when I talked about Acadians, when I talk about uh, Quebecers, we have to uh, understand that the oath was a tool of discrimination for many years. So uh, the way that Acadians that were deported were chosen was on the basis of whether or not you would take an oath to the King of England, period. And for certain positions in the history of Quebec, well, there were several forms of oath, but a, a, an oath to the king or a note that would say that you deny loyalty to the Pope, the Catholic Church. The oath has been a tool in the history of uh, Canada to discriminate against Francophones. And I'm, I'm mentioning that because it is a fact at this point that it triggered something in the population. I don't know what impact it has. It may have a small impact or a very large impact, but I think I underestimated and many people underestimated that people actually are connected with their history. Uh, people have maybe not studied in detail each date, but somehow when we managed to enter without taking that oath, and it was the first time in the history of Quebec, it triggered a lot of uh, emotion and a lot of um, uh, satisfaction that we could move forward sometimes, that some justice could be uh, achieved through a bit of perseverance. So it had an effect. It's too early to tell you what effect it has, but I'm mentioning it, mentioning it, mentioning it. Sorry, because I think um, it is very connected to the independence of Quebec. From my standpoint as a leader, when I'm told arguments against my project, the most uh, the, the 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 argument that I hear the most is it's never going to work. You're going to fail. You're wasting your time. So it's not based on how the Canada functions or what, are, what is the interest of Quebec. It's really just like it's not going to work. The second uh, argument that is uh, very frequent and uh, that has been used in 1980 and 1995 is the argument of fear uh, in uh, an economic or a political uh, angle. So it's basically to say, well, you could try to be a country, but then you will fail and you'll be poor. 
And it's, I think it's connected to a colonialism. It's not connected specifically to the British uh, Empire. Usually coloni colonialism will tell uh, populations that their level of uh, wealth, their prosperity is connected to the greatness of the empire, but that leaving the empire will come with uh, trouble, but will also come with failures because the empire is um, making its part. So of course, nowadays, nobody says the empire, but people will say Ottawa, will say the federal government in the, in the exact same fashion. And so um, I'm mentioning that moment because people saw the oath to the king as something impossible to achieve. It was told on several occasions, it will not happen. And then it took 12 minutes in the chamber, in the uh, Salon Bleu, the National Assembly, 12 minutes and it was done. And the next day, the reaction was, everybody said, oh, of course, of course it makes sense. And in the next weeks, we realized that nobody will ask for the oath to the King of England again. There's no chance during the next legislature that one of the 20, uh, 125 elected member of parliament will raise uh, their hand and say, I, re I would really want to swear an oath to the King of England. It it's not gonna come back. And, and the parallel with, the, uh, with independence is that often we're told that it's impossible. Often we'll, t uh, and I think that once it will be done, a bit in the same fashion, nobody will want to have another government on top of Quebec's government and have the negotiations I just mentioned that are very difficult and not to the satisfaction of Quebecers. And people will think over time that it's just normal mm -hmm. and that it's a form also of justice towards First Nations and towards Francophones that finally, after centuries of colonialism, will get uh, their state and a recognition of their existence at the United Nations, at the Olympics, because that it, that's also a, the, the topic that there's a lack of recognition. Uh, I've been advocating for uh, teams that represent Quebec in all competitions. Uh, I've been also advocating for uh, as much as diplomacy as possible for Quebec and the, the Canadian regime is really not help, helping on that topic. There, there's also a quest not only for justice over the long history of Quebec, but a quest for the recognition of our mere existence from a linguistic and cultural uh, point of view and from a territory point of view as well. Um, so all this is at stake currently. Um, I have to mention that Parti Québécois has only three members of parliament right now. And at the same time is the second political force in the polls. So it's a very paradoxical, uh, very strange situation. Um, last poll we were at 18%. We'll see how this uh, evolves. But I think uh, to finish my initial uh, presentation of those topics, um, a lot is, is being said about self-determination of people, about nationalism. I think in the case of Quebec, we're more talking about democracy. Democracy and how you deal with democracy when your background is of colonial nature and when you have constant difficulties to reflect the will of your people in your bills because half of your taxes and half of the bills are done by another government that has to consider other interests. So when you have an economic mission of Canada, there is an inherent uh, conflict of interest if you have an industry in Ontario that pushes for uh, one industry Quebec that has its own agenda and the West that has another agenda. So there's also a, a question of what is the right size for a state in order for interest to be legitim legitimately represented. And I think uh, uh, Jane Jacobs, uh, an author um, from Toronto, originally from the United States, has written a lot about that. Uh, the fact that the size might be sometimes a problem in terms of managing competing interests, conflicting interests. And it's especially the case when you're the 2% who speaks French and who has a reality that is really different uh, from what other uh, provinces or states in the United States may experience. So uh, I'm, I'll finish with this. It, it's, it's, it's a broad uh, overview of uh, the project. It's very, in its essence, it's very simple to understand. If Quebec becomes a country, 
it will have one parliament that decides on a democratic uh, basis and uh, we are still thinking that it needs to be done through a, a referendum through a, a democratic uh, process that it that is legitimate so of course we're interested in what is happening in scotland we're interested in what is happening in catalonia um, and uh, for the rest of the presentation i mean there, there are so many angles i've covered so many topics that i'm really open to talk about any of those elements uh, so as to uh, in, to uh, answer the angles that are more interesting to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the field is yours. Paul has invited you to ask about any any of the topics he's covered, or no doubt others. So um, who wants to speak first? Well, lots of people straight away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so. I'm from Montreal, I'm from Quebec, and obviously, um, I think I have two main questions. Um, I want, I think there should, it, obviously in my head it's clear that uh, the Quebec nation is um, a different nation in itself, and that obviously we do have a lot of um, differences when it comes to the more Anglo-Saxon predominant culture in English-speaking provinces. But somehow I think we are also in a stage in politics where we are facing um, very important struggles and challenges that are heavily um, globalized. And we think about climate change, we can think about um, uh, increase in gender or uh, increase, sorry, in, in inequality gaps. Um, so yes, there's cultural imperialism, but there's also economic and capitalism as a system of oppression and imperialism. And I just wonder how within that kind of sea of change and crucial challenges that we have to, to face even for our own survival, not even as a culture, but as humans, how um, independence can fit in this, in the sense that it can also be approached in terms of division. And I think that another current question I have is how does that um, movement uh, fit with being harmonized and having a society or a movement that is heavily equalitarian in terms of recognition of uh, not only our culture but people that live in Quebec that not necessarily are from the main historic uh, history than us. So I'm talking about obviously indigenous communities. We have been colonized, but we have colonized them, and also about migrant communities that are, I think excessively important in terms of diversity and the societal tissue that we have and I think that it's a we are very lucky in Quebec to have access to that kind of diversity and I would just wonder if there is kind of a underlying um, exclusion that lies within the universal universalism that kind of is um, put forward as a philosophy uh, behind having behind the, the, the independence movement. And that's something that, as a voter, would worry me. So, okay. okay. Questions. Any questions? Yeah, so yeah. on the global issue versus independence. So, of course, uh, the environment is a good example. Many issues are global. Now, should the response, should be, should the response be democratic? In which case, there needs to be a definite unit of democracy. Or should the response be global, but then through which mechanism of decision making? Um, and I, I hear um, in Canada, you have a very uh, community-based uh, approach to some of those topics, and then a globalized approach that I associate with uh, neoliberalism. Because once you depossess people of their democratic decision making on those topics, saying it's so global, somebody else will take care of it globally. 
uh, the question is who is going to take care of it? So my answer to uh, that topic is that not only democracy remains the best approach to tackling those global issues, um, and also the what we just experienced with COVID-19, countries stealing masks from each other, uh, a, a global economic system that look pretty fragile as soon as there's a, a bit of shaking, uh, should uh, make us think of how we guarantee the safety, the food, the medication, and the basics for our population. So self-determination seems to me in a more unstable world, given uh, what climate change uh, will uh, have uh, in terms of consequences. I think not only democracy is the right way to come to the best answer, but it's also a way to ensure that your population on a given territory are making sure that they're okay because if you only rely on other states to supply you with what you need in terms of crisis, in, in a moment of crisis, what we've seen in, in, in uh, the COVID-19 uh, is not reassuring uh, from my standpoint. Uh, in terms of uh, who's included, of course, if there's a, because there's a, political and philosophical debate about universalism. So some people will pretend that if you have a universal approach to inequalities, it is in itself discriminato discriminatory and it hides an agenda, it hides racism or it hides... Uh... So I would separate the two groups. Uh, First Nations are nations and we need to, we do, and we all need to recognize them as such. So for me, as I mentioned, the Indian Act is not going to change within Canada and it's unacceptable. So I think the best way is to trigger negotiations equal to equal. And they're very interested when you talk to them, uh, they're interested in that. In terms of diversity, we're not dealing with nations. We're dealing with people with a cultural background, a linguistic background that sometimes just, just join the Quebec society. And our doctrine on that topic is um, uh, two backgrounds that are together uh, and that will allow the sustainability of the French language. And, and the melting pot from the United States or the multiculturalism in Canada is a very different context in Canada because when you're uh, in Quebec, because when you're in Quebec, you always have to think, is the French language still a, a common language that has a common culture and doesn't mean that it has to be your sole culture but it has to if it has a future there needs to be some form of universality from a linguistic and cultural standpoint otherwise over time uh, what happened in other Canadian provinces with francophones will happen in Quebec as well so I don't see it as discrimination or anything negative my standpoint and I know it's very not it's very different and not dominant in Canada but to me to categorize people in groups and really determine them as a ethnocultural or religious group is more discriminating because we can't we, we make assumptions about people because they're from a group and we don't consider them as full citizens as equal citizens and uh, universality brings I think a form of citizenship that respects and we need to respect the differences, make sure that it's a fair society, but that also uh, tells people we're in the same boat, we're in the same society, we're paying the same uh, taxes, and we have things in common. We have differences, but we have many more things in common. And, and, and so I, I see universality as positive, uh, but I know it's not uh, the case in many universities in uh, Canada, but that's one of the differences between uh, Quebec and Canada on those topics. Good. All right. So people already know. I saw somebody in the second row and somebody in the third row and somebody else in the second row. One, two, three. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned competing interests is one of the main reasons for independence. And I'm wondering if competing interests interest is just kind of part of, of being in a country. So for example, even if Quebec gains independence, there will still be competing interests within Quebec. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you look at the 2022 elections, yeah, yeah. the National Assembly elections, like rural areas would largely for the goal. Um, and then also if you look at then in like urban areas, it was almost all liberals. Yeah, yeah. So there's going to be competing interests. And like, so for example, I'm from Maine and I have religion, which is like the least religious state in the US. And I have right wing religious conservatives making laws for me. The reason I'm, I'm fine with that to an extent 
is that I see the benefits of being part of the U.S. as greater than some of the disadvantages. You, you so, said you were from Maine. Maine, yeah. So what happens then, I think one of the reasons that people might mention failures, like uh, possible economic failures after Quebec became independence, is that it would lose free access to the Canadian market, uh, no longer be part of a trade deal with the U.S., Mexico, and the EU, for example. Um, and also, if you look at like Catalonia independence or after the referendum, uh, 3,000 companies switched uh, or uh, changed their like, office locations within Spain. So what happens economically? And also, there's going to be competing interests no matter what. So do you think possibly that the, the advantages of being part of Canada? I think you're totally, you're totally right when you say that it's inherent to democracy to have competing interests. Uh, what uh, the international uh, agreements say on that topic is that if you're a nation and you fit within the definition of nation and that your competing interest is your mere survival from a lingu linguistic and cultural point of view, then you have that right of self-determination. And uh, that's why I ask if you're from Maine, because you know that in the East Coast, uh, you go in many cities where there was a lot of French Canadian names. And uh, nowadays, uh, we have a member of our party who says he's the last Franco-American. Why is that? Because if you're a linguistic group within a political system where you're not only in minority, but you have a history of colonialism and difficult uh, relationship, you're not dealing with just a disagreement on how much taxes you should pay. You're dealing with a competing interest, uh, notably, on whether your language and your culture is sustainable given the laws from the central government. So what the international law says on that is that if you qualify as a nation, which is the case of Quebec and it, it's been recognized by the Parliament of Canada, then we're not dealing in, uh, uh, with common uh, competing interests, but we're dealing with the right uh, for sustainability of a culture and a language, which didn't happen in Louisiana, which didn't happen in the east coast of the United States, and which is uh, unfortunately, not the case in many Canadian provinces where the decline has been uh, more than noticeable for the French speaking uh, Canadians. Okay. Go, go, go. Please. Thank you very much, Monsieur Parlement, for your question. I do have one concern. I think your presentation is very compelling, and I'm going to agree with most parts of it. But I think that using the universal rhetoric to justify what are practical, everyday, active exclusion of minorities in Quebec is extremely concerning. We have Bill 21, we have Bill 96, which exclude uh, people from doing their jobs, from, like, it, I think it's it's really unsatisfactory to see it through the, the university scheme. Um, and I guess my question is, what what do you conceive is would be the role of an independent Quebec in protecting our minorities, our new minorities? If we're not the minority anymore, what are we doing to protect our minorities in practice? Um, and would you think that it, it is acceptable to keep on resorting to the notwithstanding clause that we have as well in the Quebec Charter? Um, so I'm very curious to have yeah. Okay. Well, um, and in your answer, not everybody will be familiar with these matters, Bill 96 and the notwithstanding yeah. clause. Okay. So, so it might be helpful to those yeah. to whom those I mean can, nothing I to can, yeah. explain. Good, uh, yeah, indeed. indeed. So uh, we're talking about uh, bills that pertain to the secular state in Quebec or the language and that apply to all. Now, if you forbid uh, religious signs for positions within the government that represent the government, uh, it there's an argument from certain uh, a certain proportion of the population that it's actually targeting minority groups, um, uh, especially the conversation ha has been around the Muslim faith uh, signs. In effect, what the law objectively says is that all religious signs are not allowed, and uh, there are two interpretations. It's been debated for now 15 years, and it's not stopping because. Obviously, people are very convinced from one side and another. Uh, the debate is about whether it is universality of a measure that separates state and religion is 
like any other law, it applies to everyone. A debate that occurred in Canada, if I recall, is whether you should be forced to have a helmet on your motorcycle uh, if you have, for religious reason, a religious sign, uh, a religious symbol on your head. Uh, so there are really two schools of thinking on that topic. Uh, some Quebecers will say the law applies to everyone. We're not targeting anyone. We just want that principle to apply to everyone. Otherwise, the law is not fair. And there's another uh, uh, perspective to say, well, we're very interested in groups that are deemed uh, discriminated. And uh, since we assume that they are being tar targeted and they are, they are being discriminated, we want the law to apply, but not to certain groups or in a more it's been debated. I, I don't want to make a very uh, too short summary, but to get to the question of what is Quebec stance once it's independent. I have to say that if I answer the question saying what we will do is this and that, it wouldn't be honest because the real position is democracy. And democracy is unforeseeable in the sense that, I, I, of course, there's already a Charter of Human Rights in Quebec. So if you're not within Canada, you don't have the not with, with notwithstanding clause anymore because you're, you're changing the legal regime. So we do have one in the Quebec Charter. Yes, but what I mean is that the relationship with Canada and the tribunals are changing all of a sudden. Um, it is an interesting topic. What I'm certain about is that my, my stance or my hope uh, is that if you give to democracy the ruling on those topics, because I agree that becoming a, a country changes the status of certain groups. And, and, and so we will have to be careful. Um, but I doubt that those, uh, that this equilibrium, for instance, uh, English speaking Quebecers have rights to education that are very, very entrenched. Mm -hmm. I don't see that changing. Should we bonify? Should we add something? Should we? In general, I trust democracy, um, and I, I understand that if um, the Parti Québécois achieves independence, those debates will be in constant adjustment for decades to come. So I'm, I'm, I'm more in the very core and fundamental principle of whether Quebecers deserve to decide for themselves, given that sometimes they have different views than from the rest of Canada, and it comes with a good load of Quebec bashing or contempt towards those choices. And um, I am of the universalist view. I'm an old school social democrat uh, in that sense, because new progressist theories tend to create uh, hi hierarchies uh, that we didn't have pr uh, before or, or take stance as to who's discriminated and who's not. Um, but I know other sovereignists that don't think like me on those topics. So I think when we talk about independence of Quebec, we need to be able to take a step back and say it creates opportunities to adjust a model that needs adjustment, at least for the First Nations, it's obvious. And then we need to trust our abil ability, as other uh, democracies are capable of, our ability to debate. And it's been a very peaceful and quiet democracy given everything I just explained in the history of Quebec. If you compare to other nations that were part of the uh, Commonwealth or other nations that achieved their independence, Quebec's democracy has been quite easygoing and quite peaceful. So I'm trusting uh, these debates to happen, um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that it will take time to adjust the model to make sure that everybody's comfortable. I, I don't hear or see any will, especially with the Anglophones, within the members of the Parti Québécois. There's a genuine will to have everybody feel like Quebecers. Uh, it's part of the universalist uh, uh, way of thinking, but there's a, a, sometimes a, an impression that people, um, some Quebecers don't feel they're, they're Quebecers, 100% uh, Quebecers, and it's, we should be sorry about that. So what if giving birth to a country 
becomes an occasion of co-creation, of uh, solidarity, of uh, bringing people together. Um, because the identities are so difficult to, it's so mixed up. Are you Canadian? Are you Quebecer? Are you a Montrealer? Are you part of an ethnocultural community? Are you a religious community? Identity matter. Even if we say we don't want to have any identity discussion in politics, I'm afraid it's inherent. Not afraid, I'm, I'm happy it's inherent that we care about each other, that we have relationships with each other. Um, I think the creation of a country will open uh, conversations, and I'm trusting the judgment and the goodwill of Quebecers uh, as a democracy. Okay, one, two, three, four. Merci pour votre discours. Euh, moi, je suis Toronto, mais j'étudie à McGill aussi, en fait, donc euh, le Québec me manque beaucoup. Ah, je vais poser ma question en, en anglais. Sure. C'est bon. Um, so, I wanted to pick up on Bill 96 and your discussion about like indigenous languages and a nation nation relationship. There's been a lot of discussion about the way in which Bill 96 has been implemented in Quebec on indigenous communities, like in Kahnawake, where there's fears that the education system is like Francisized at the expense of indigenous languages. In your sort of sovereign Quebec, <coughs> would you expect Indigenous nations to use the French language in their um, self-governance? And sort of double-barreling this question, um, if the James Bay, uh, the decree of the James Bay, um, self-determined in their own national interest to stay within Canada, would you respect their right of self-determination? Um, okay, so the two very important questions. Um, on the language issue, there are two uh, stances of my party on those um, so when you say that the French language will be taught to the expense of indigenous languages, I disagree. It's to the expense of the English as a common language for education. So as I see it, French language is a competence that is useful in Quebec, obviously, since it's the official language. So you have a history class, you have a physics class, you have a there should be a French class, and I don't think it's to the expense of uh, anything else than uh, learning is important, uh, and uh, the more tools uh, we have in society, the better. Um, we also think, but it's complicated because it's a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, relationship, but we also think that there's a lot of room for protecting uh, First Nations la languages, uh, but we can't do it unila unilaterally. Um, but I think if we are to rethink, uh, based on the previous question, if we are to rethink democracy <laughs> in an independent country, we need to think how are we going to create a parliament that is maybe an, in, an, an in, uh, innovation for those relationships between uh, nations. Uh, your second question was? James Bay. James Bay. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at the UN Convention, um, the... Um, Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and what the UN created as a framework and based on my conversations that we started with uh, nations on the territory of Quebec, uh, the, the declaration says that th there is a, a territorial integrity that remains and it also points out and it's been the conversations I had that the concept we have of property over land is difficult, difficultly applicable to the First Nation conception of those issues. So I think the best way to come with something that is an inno innovation and a success in terms of respect and sustainability of relations between nations is to bring in the United Nations, to say, okay, we've just created a country and we are many nations on that ter territory. You have just created in 2006 or seven, just created a framework and we have an occasion right here. So please assist us. And it's very complicated because you have many different nations whose interest or way of functioning are not the same and you don't want something that is unfair. So um, it is a challenge, but it's, it's also a, a wonderful occasion. And I think it's much more coherent than keeping the Indian Act forever and at the same time uh, making a, Declarations. Declarations are nice, but if they're not followed with any anything substantial, what's the use? So that's basically where we're where we're at. I just wanted to add regarding the Bill Twenty One and the Open Six and 
96 question um, that I feel like it, it, it's, it's not a question, it's just like my opinion and I feel really, very strongly about that topic and um, I feel like in an independent Quebec we would be less <coughs> defensive about all these it's different legislations that are now to protect our culture. It's, it's the only way we have now to protect our, our identity, our culture. Mm -hmm. So I feel like in an in independent Quebec, we would be much more open to minority groups and more in confrontation with them. Not that we are, but maybe it's the impression that we are under right now. Well, I have a, I have a comment on that. Um, since under the Trudeau government, and I don't want to generalize Canada as a whole, because Canada has uh, different political views throughout the territory, but under the Trudeau government, the strong identity politics based on community is also uh, together with funding of organizations that are quite critical of Quebec's view. I'm not going to name any of, of those organizations, but among the organizations in Quebec or outside Quebec that are the most critical about how Quebec's laws are uh, one group in Quebec said it was exactly like Russia and Ukraine. And they, they are serious about it. And it was said by Marlene Jennings, who's a former member of parliament in Ottawa. Those groups are funded by the federal government. So my idea, I'm not sure though, I can't promise, but I, I have a feeling that if the federal government doesn't create um, a tension whereby uh, there's a, through Quebec bashing and through uh, certain institutions of the federal government, I feel that there's fear that is created mm -hmm. towards Quebecers that doesn't amount with how they behave, mm -hmm. doesn't amount with uh, the criminal, uh, the, the very little uh, criminal uh, rate, tout uh, criminalité, uh, the, 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 the fact that it's a very peaceful and uh, even uh, very uh, passive, that's the right word. It's so passive. Uh, so th there, there are impacts of how the institutions fund certain ideas and how independence is being prevented actively since the 60s. And uh, I think that it's hard to know how it's going to look once independence is done, but obviously the incentives and the way the funding works to certain organizations and certain messages uh, will change. So I think it could be for the best. I think it could be for a more empath empathetic, uh, more uh, empathetic. Um, <laughs> I, but I, 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 I can't, I can't tell. That's what I hope for. But um, I think uh, I agree with uh, that observation. I have to be careful. To to be honest as well, I need to remind you that as the leader of a political party in Quebec that is democratic, if, because I had many ideas in my head when you ask your question, but I have to uh, keep the responsibility of uh, taking stances that are career coherent with discussions that we will have and keep on having mm -hmm. that are pertaining to those topics. So, so that's the president of the party at the back there. Mm -hmm. And he's just saying, yes, that's right, Paul. <laughs> uh, um, so there are, in a university context, there are many things that come to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think your questions are exactly on the right track or in the, in the right uh, spot. Um, and I'm fully aware that in the upcoming years and the upcoming Congress that we have, we are specifically dealing and uh, having a conversation on those topics. So has to so have so that we have a something in writing that uh, put forward a vision at least that triggers after a conversation that might be adjusted but that we need to get these uh, topics going it is a democratic party very democratic um, the culture of the parti québécois has been rough on its leaders mm -hmm. uh, because of that uh, rooted approach to debating uh, public policies and I'm very proud of it because it created public policies that are very innovative. It's a small democratic miracle as far as I'm concerned, because in many countries, what is called a democratic country, uh, party is actually quite uh, fixed before it starts. 
it's not the case of the Parti Québécois. So there's a few things that are in my mind that will maybe come up in the upcoming years, but I need to respect the fact as well that I'm responsible for ten th of ten thousands of uh, members that want to uh, also be heard uh, on those topics. Uh, we're still good for time because uh, uh, we should finish probably about half past six, <laughs> but um, I've got two people already waiting to ask questions, and if there are others, uh, the time to catch my eye is, is now or, or, or now -ish. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll take the two that have already caught my eye, and then we'll have another round. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. My name's Nick. I'm from Halifax. Actually, um, I want to thank you first for speaking a second language today. I'm, I'm learning French, but I, I'm afraid that if I gave my question in French, it would be a little bit of gibberish. Um, <laughs> no problem. Uh, with that said, um, we talked a lot about democracy today. Um, and there was one referendum, two referendums, um, and subsequent provincial elections that have all resulted in um, federalist leading parties. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question is, given that the electoral process has played out, um, is there any room to sort of snap your fingers for some sort of constitutional reform that would have it integrated Quebec into Canada? And what would that look like? Anything's, nothing's off the table. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Um, first of all, your point is good. There's been two referendums. So, of course, everything I've just mentioned is in the hypothesis that the party that I'm representing becomes a majority government. And that's the first step before anything uh, further. And as to reforming Canada, um, of course, I, I will see it from the Quebec's perspective. So from Quebec's perspective, I think justice matters. And not only for French-speaking Quebecers, for the First Nations as well. Having a moment where things change and things are being renegotiated matters. Um, as I mentioned, it's difficult then to foresee exactly how, but there is a moment that changes history um, and then creates possibilities that didn't exist before. I have to mention that Quebecers are happy about Canadians. So it's a very strange uh, situation from that standpoint because some independence will ha occur when there's genuine tensions. Ask Quebecers about what they think about Canadians. They're very happy. Um, so we're dealing with the subject matters I mentioned in terms of self-determination, in terms of justice in the history, in terms of will to exist culturally, lingu linguistically, worldwide. Um, but Quebec would certainly not be in a mode of not talking to other provinces after the independence. Um, and look for the oath, uh, see for an instance the oath uh, to the King of England. Now it's being discussed in New Brunswick. Sometimes you do something and it seems like so big and actually the next day people go to work and things continue, but it triggers possibilities uh, with uh, other provinces for in, in that case that may be very uh, constructive, creative. The, the collaboration from a trade standpoint and a legal standpoint, the collaboration between provinces and Canada is very strange. It's not optimal at all. It's as if, it's as if we're not in the same country. So what happens if Quebec declares independence, starts negotiating with First Nation? What impact on other nations on the territory, what's the stance of, of each province? Are these provinces not going to talk to each other? Of course they're going to talk to each other. So um, the way my, my parents, who voted no at both referendums, the way my parents, <laughs> and they're now member of the Parti Québécois, so I've been, <laughs> I've been very consistent. Uh, the way my parents saw it in the 80s and 90s was very dramat dramatic. And, and re remember the love-in, so Canadians coming to Montreal, we love you. Um, it's as if it's a breakup. But where is, going, where is the territory going? It's not a breakup, it's the same territory. It's, we're next to each other and uh, we're, we're used to collaboration on, on many fronts. It's difficult on certain topics that I just mentioned. And I think it justifies uh, Quebec becoming a country, but what then? I'm, I'm certain of one thing, Quebecers 
we'll be very happy to uh, negotiate and hear what uh, Canadians have to say. So it triggers, I think, things that were not uh, uh, thought of in the rest of Canada, maybe. Mm -hmm. What happens if, and how can we make sure that everybody's happy? And you'll see no resistance in Quebec on that topic, because the, it's a very complex uh, set of identities. But there is there is a part of each Quebecer that has a good opinion of Canada. They're very mad when Justin Trudeau makes a decision that is really favoring maybe another view or another part of their country and not Quebec's. They're worried about the decline of the French language, but are they... Do they have a good opinions about uh, Canadians? I, I think it's uh, widely the case.